Be sure you download the note card that goes along with this sermon, and you can print it out, and you can follow along. Fill it in as you follow the sermon. If you like this sermon, want to see more like this, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the bell notification so you'll be notified when other new content is added to this site. We try to add sermons as often as we can. We'll try to add some Bible question and answers that we've done before in the past. Other things we may be adding to this. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to follow us on social media, there are links to our social media accounts in the video description below. Now, let's jump into the sermon. I have my Bible open to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, I invite you to grab a Bible, your own Bible, pew Bible, whatever you can find there. Turn to John chapter 15. When you get there, we will start at verse 1, where Jesus says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken you. Abide in me, and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burn. If you abide in me, and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As Jesus is right on the cusp of being arrested, tortured, and murdered at the hands of godless men, we find our Lord not seeking encouragement, but giving encouragement. You would think that one who is about to suffer so greatly would be eating up any sort of well wishes, encouragement, or love, but instead we find him giving what we would most likely be searching for. Surely, the words of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 ring true in our ears. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others comes to our mind when we see Jesus doing what he's doing in John chapters 13 through 17. Seeing what we see in these chapters in John's gospel and what we have read in our daily Bible reading, I believe we can more clearly understand what Paul is saying when he writes, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interest of others. Our Lord knew the difficulties that were about to face his apostles. He wanted to do everything he could to make sure they were ready to face what was to come. Yet in the middle of a discussion where much encouragement is offered. We also see Jesus handing down some important admonitions that the apostles would do well to remember as they went forward in their work in the gospel. Here in John 15, verse 1, we find Jesus instructing his closest followers to remember that he is the true vine. Twice in these verses... We see Jesus referring to himself as the vine. 
Why does he refer to himself as such? This I am statement of Jesus is the last such statement in God's gospel account, John's gospel account. It serves as both an admonition and a warning for these men to remember going forward. This warning and these principles were to aid them in their lives as disciples. And they continue to aid as much in the same way for us. Let us take a few moments to conclude our studies of Jesus' I am statements by looking at what we can learn about this world, Jesus, and ourselves from Jesus stating, I am the true vine. First of all, I believe that Jesus saying that I am the vine and you are the branches, he's stating there are false vines. John chapter 15, verse 1, I am the vine. When there's something that is true, then there are certainly false. If I plant a grapevine, I want maybe a Concord. Maybe I want a Thompson Seedless. Maybe I want a Candace, some other type of grape. Maybe I want a Scuppernon, a Muscadine some kind of wine grape. If I plant one particular variety of vine, I've got, if I want a Concord vine, and I tell someone I have a Concord vine, and in three years when that vine produces, the grapes are not purple, they're white, I have a false vine as far as Concord is concerned. And thus it is in the religious world. We have to be in the correct vine. We have to be a part of the correct vine. There are false vines. Many have elevated other individuals or ideas to a place of preeminence and authority. The fact that Jesus has to state, I am the true vine, tells me that there will be those who try to prop themselves up as a vine deserving preeminence and authority. Throughout the world, we see different individuals or ideas having been raised up to a place of great import. They have been lifted up to a position where others feel they are worthy of the devotion and honor that we would reserve only for Jesus. Many different religions have their own God-type figure. I'll put that in quote. Or Savior. That has been elevated to a higher standard than just a regular person. Muhammad is known as God's most holy prophet within Islam. And he is seen as being the greatest prophet of the greatest prophets who is due more respect than just an ordinary man. Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, is seen as an individual of extreme enlightenment who is able to transcend the struggles of this world. He is seen as the ultimate example of who people ought to want to be like. Now, there are examples of this same type of thinking found under the Christianity, quote, unquote, umbrella. Think of the position in which the Pope holds within the Catholic Church. He is known as the physical head of the whole church on earth, the Papa of the church. He is referred to by many as Holy Father. I don't believe it a stretch to say that he has taken up a place where many would call him a vine since he has taken up a position of such authority and preeminence. Joseph Smith, founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, what we refer to today as Mormons, is seen as God's special prophet, and he is revered as if he was a perfect man who truly knew the mind of God. 
even with our own lives, we might elevate other individuals to a place of prominence where we are willing to listen and follow them no matter what they say. Or it could be that we elevate different ideas to the same sort of status. What is traditional is what we will do and follow. Whatever is done in the name of unity or love will be what we will do and seek, whether it be a person, an idea, or a concept. We must be aware that they can be elevated to a place of being a vine, and certainly most of them are false vines. Jesus stands alone as the one who deserves the preeminence. But why is it that Jesus is the one deserving of such a place of prominence in our minds? One reason is because God has elevated him to such a place because of his perfect example of love and giving. He gave himself to come to earth to die for the sins of mankind. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 through 11. He didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking on that form of a man. It is at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord. Furthermore, Paul writes to the Colossians that Jesus is worthy of the preeminence because he is God and has done incredible things for us. Take a look at Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 there on the screen. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things, it says, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus, the true vine then, expects his branches to bear much fruit. John chapter 15, verse 2. Remember what we read? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes. Why? That it may bear more fruit. Through the year, on my grapevines, I'll go through now and I will look. I will see where the clusters are. One thing I will do, I will prune back so the sunlight can get into those clusters to help ripen them. Now, I can also cut some of the green back. That is, some of those branches that are not bearing fruit, that don't have clusters. I can cut them out because they're not going to do me any good unless I want to take them and clone them and make new grapevines. But if that's not what I'm wanting to do, I will cut them away like Jesus said, and I will let them wither and burn them in a fire. What am I after? I'm after fruit. What's Jesus after? After fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. He says, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you 
can do nothing. So the presence of Jesus within our lives will be evident. This is type of influence from Jesus onto others can be seen in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, when Peter and John were standing before the Sanhedrin, being questioned as to how this lame man was now up about and walking, Peter stood boldly before his captors and declared that everything they had seen had been done, watch this, by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. These words of Peter were a slap in the face, so to speak, to those surrounding him because it was their hands that Jesus had been killed by. It took some real guts for Peter and John to say what they said. Yet it was by these words and their demeanor that the people were amazed and be to began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. This same kind of thing can happen to us if we are willing to allow Christ and His Spirit to influence us to the full extent. When we allow for Jesus to be our source of spiritual strength, our main focus and our main purpose will be changed. We will be made to be different. Instead of living a life where we only live for self and perform the works of the flesh that are seen in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, that we will begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 25. If these things are present in our lives, then it will only be a result of a life that has been filled with and being led by the Holy Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. If we are truly the branches of, of King Jesus, then we will look and behave as he lived and as he looks and as he thinks. If we don't bear fruit, then we will be cut off. However, what happens? What happens if we're not living a life that shows us being led by the Spirit? Jesus makes it very clear in verse 2 that the branches that don't bear fruit are cut off or allowed to wither and thrown in the fire. The expectation of Jesus is that His branches will be busy bearing fruit that honors Him. But if we are not doing that, then He says we will be taken away and cut off. If we are not bearing fruit as we should, then we need to figure out what the problem is. Is there a lack of dedication on our part? Are we not fully invested in our faith? Maybe we don't truly appreciate what has been done for us. So we don't give a full effort to live for Him as His kingdom as we should. Maybe we are not bearing fruit because we are not truly abiding in Him as He says we must. Eight times in these nine verses, we see Jesus speaking to the need of us to abide in Him and what happens if we fail to do so. And then, the ability to bear much fruit depends on our willingness to abide in Him. John chapter 15, verse 4, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, 
He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burn. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love, he says there. If we don't bear fruit, then Jesus, then we will be cut off from the vine. To abide in Jesus, we must fully submit to his authority, the true vine. We are fully dependent upon Jesus as our source of nutrients in life, much like the grapevine branch that I see come out every year. I go in February, 1st of March. I anticipate that new spur producing a new branch. And I look, I patiently watch, looking for those fruiting clusters that I hope to have come from that new branch. That branch depends on that vine. If that vine gets cut, that branch dies. If a branch is removed from that vine, guess what? It dies. I will do some what they call flick pruning. Places I do not want branches to come, I will take my thumb as while they're young and I will flip it off and a branch will not grow there. If it goes away from that vine, it soon dies, even before it gets very long. A dying or dead branch cannot bear fruit. Therefore, if Jesus expects for us to bear fruit, then we must be able to stay attached to him as the vine. This seems simple enough, but we must recognize that staying attached to Jesus as the vine depends on our willingness to abide in him. Now, this means that we must submit to him in all things. Once again, remember, eight times in John 15, 1 through 9, we find Jesus speaking of the need to abide in him. To abide in Jesus, we must come to him on his terms, not ours. We must recognize that he was speaking the truth when he said he was the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. He was able to speak such things truthfully because he is the one to whom all power and authority has been granted. Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 18, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How is such a thing possible? It was made possible because God exalted him to such a position. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Philippians 2, verse 9. We see this picture painted for us. In Acts chapter 2, verse 33 through 36, Peter declares that Jesus, the man that they had crucified, was now seated at the right hand of God. He was seated in a place of authority, and they need to respect him as such. He was and is both Lord and Christ. He is Lord, the one possessing authority. He is the Christ, the one who offers salvation. Again, this all sounds simple at face value. Of course, we want to abide in Jesus, gain the benefits of being a branch on his vine. Yet here's the thing. People want to abide in Jesus and gain him as their Savior, but they are not willing to submit to him as Lord. They love the salvation, but they don't love the idea of having to submit. They love Jesus as Savior, but they don't love Jesus the Lord. Unfortunately for them, Jesus is both. Our willingness to submit to him will only, unwillingness rather, to submit to him 
will only lead to our being cut off. This type of mentality will lead us to being thrown away from Jesus, and it gives way to denominational thinking that the that there are many branches. The Father will not allow for a branch to dictate what the vine will do. As branches, we are only able to do as the vine desires. This is the crux of the issue. When some want to use these verses as justification for denominationalism, they would claim that Jesus is the vine as truly he is but that we are all just different branches of him. Of course, this sounds nice. It's nice to think that all the different denominations who by their way, belief, teach, and practice do just different, but offer contradictory message or just different branches on the same vine. It's nice to think that way, that we can all do so different and produce completely different fruit for Jesus. But this is all very illogical. How can two completely different branches and teaching completely different doctrines and practices and their faith contradictory ways belong to the same vine? It just can't happen. Because all that, Jesus is speaking here of individuals and not separate types of churches. Jesus never had the division of today as a part of his plan for the church. Instead of being divided, we must be willing to submit to Jesus' lordship and authority. Otherwise, we will be cut off from Jesus and thrown into fire to be burned up. Our love for Jesus must be to the degree that we will fully submit to his authority in all things. The love of God was seen to give his son on our behalf. Jesus' love was seen in giving his life for us as the sacrifice on the cross. Yes, Jesus wants at this moment to encourage his apostles for the difficulties he had, the time he's writing I'm talking about. He also seeks to remind them that their success moving forward would greatly depend on their willingness to abide in him as the true vine and to be his branches bearing godly fruit. While these instructions were firstly given to these hand-picked disciples, they continue to ring true for us in our lives. May we always respect Jesus as the true vine. May we submit to his authority so that we might always be successful in bearing fruit to his glory. With that, Bob's your uncle. So we come back to this question. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be a branch in the true vine of Jesus? The Bible teaches us, first of all, the gospel must be heard. In John chapter 8 and in verse 15, as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. Jesus said, you will know the truth. The truth will set you free. We must hear the gospel. Then we must believe the gospel, not our opinions, the gospel. Jesus said, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. John said of Jesus, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household, the beginning point on the road to salvation. We find the Philippian jailer took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and immediately after that he was baptized, he and his family. A sign of repentance, a sign of that change of heart, change of life, change of mindset. We must confess 
Whoever confesses me, Jesus said before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father in heaven. There must be scriptural baptism. Saul of Tarsus was asked, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Even Acts 2 and verse 38, Peter told him on the day of Pentecost, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Colossians 2, 12. We learn having been buried with him in baptism. We learn baptism is a burial. And he goes on to say there, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. First Peter 3.21, baptism corresponds to this, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then we must remain faithful as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. We must stay in the vine. We must stay in his word. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. John 17, 17. Jesus says there. And so being faithful is important. We're to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we grow, we are to supplement our faith with virtue, virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control, steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness, godliness, brotherly kindness, brotherly kindness, love. That's the steps. That's what we're to do with our life. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from becoming ineffective, unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Talking to brethren there. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. And then, do not fear the things you're about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, he says there, and have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. We must obey the gospel to be saved by the Lord in heaven. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8, Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Now with that, Bob's your uncle. If you found this video helpful and want to learn more, be sure to download the note card that goes with this lesson and our free Bible correspondence course. You will find the links to each in the description below. We here at the Spring Hill Church of Christ want to help you with your growth in the knowledge of God's Word. Remember, we are in it for the likes and subs, so be sure to subscribe. With that, thanks for watching or listening. In the meantime, in between time, we'll see you next time. Cheerio, mate. Bob's your uncle.